Here we go. Yep. On Boss Magazine must be Wednesday night. Hello everybody, Bob Lusk, the Pond Boss, coming at you live from the uh, safe confines of Gordonville, Texas at the Pond Boss World Headquarters. So glad that you guys are joining us. It's going to be a lot of fun. I'm not sure what the topic's going to be, but it's going to be fun. There's Paul Picard and Nick Tabard already. Good to see you fellas. I thought what I'd talk about today is just what, where I've been going, what I've been doing, and some fun stuff, and then entertain your questions. So let's get at it. Jason Nepstad, looky there. There you are, buddy. You're eight seconds later than normal. <laughs> I'm so glad you guys join up to do this. You guys are what really makes this fun, I promise you. There's Todd Austin. Hey, Todd, good to see you, man. Or good to know you're there. Hey, uh, you know the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine in the comment section. Click like. Share this to your timeline, and you'll be eligible for a drawing for a Pond Boss mug that knows how to keep hot things hot and cold things cold. And a pond boss hat. I mean, look at that. Ain't nothing better than a pond boss hat. There you go. If I wore hats, which I used to, but I don't anymore, I'd wear a pond boss hat. And sometimes I do, like when I'm fishing. So there you go. So let's see what's going on here. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about where I've been going, what I've been doing. Look at there, Kurt Petre from Tebado, Louisiana. Man, we got all kinds of South Louisiana folks checking in. Matter of fact, I figured I was. One of our Mr. Uh, uh, Crawdad man himself, Boudan, be on here in a little bit. Probably be making fun of my dad gum shirt, but I'm just gonna tell him I got Crawdad juice on it. There's Matt Hines from Indiana, Danny Mack checking in from down around San Antonio. Good to see you fellers. So uh, let me see if I can get this up full page so I can see what everybody's doing and read these questions. There we go. Now I can see it. Frank James. Hey Frank. Mike Cottrell, good to see you. Tim Stewart's checking in from New Jersey. Hey, Tim, man, I hope you can make it next week. I'm excited to even think you'd like to come. I was calling some of the guys that are coming today, man. I'll tell you what, we're going to have a blast. <coughs> what I'm talking about is the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology, which I hope you're chuckling at that name because I chuckle at it. You know, I thought of that name back in 2004, and I've racked my brain to come up with a better name, and I can't think of a better one. Maybe you can I uh, had a guy call me at the office and left a message, and I returned his call after last week's show. And he was his, his message, they saved it on voicemail, and I listened to it. And he he was pretty excited to find these videos. And he said, "You know, you need to you need to change the name of your show and and, and call it uh, Pond Talk." I was like, "Dude, Pond Talk." So I have to talk like this, Pond Talk. I'm Bob Lusk, the Pond Boss, and we're going to talk about ponds. No, 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 I don't know how to do that. We're not going to do it. Hey, Tyler Cole's in here early. John Mashburn, good to see you guys. Pond Boss Magazine, got to do my commercial. Hey, 35 bucks a year, cheaper than a Friday night date, and lasts a long time. So, uh, Pond Boss, I'm telling you, seriously, it's full of all kinds of nuggets. Speaking of nuggets, there's Purina Game Fish, or Sport Fish Feeds, Aquamax Feeds. But uh, one of the mo most common comments I get from people is, is they'll say, you know what, I may not read the whole magazine, but every article I read, I get at least one thing I can use. And you know, as a writer and a fisheries biologist, that's that's pretty important for me to hear, because it kind of helps keep me going. And 35 bucks, you know, <clears throat> cheap enough. So uh, if you haven't subscribed yet, please do. The Bob Blusk Institute of Higher Pondology, the first one's coming up next week. We got room for one more person. And uh, Tim Stewart, I'm hoping that's you. So. Uh, Man, I've got the agenda lined out. We've got live music. We're going to do a cool field trip, electrofishing, tagging fish, identifying plants, weighing and measuring, handling lots of fish. It's going to be a big, big deal. Danny Max coming. Uh, you like me? <laughs> I like me. Miller Genuine Draft all day in cigarettes and heavy red wine and cigars at night. <laughs> Danny Mac, we're going to have some fun. We just got through building a big deck with a, with a roof over it so we can have more outdoor space. Not like we don't have enough already, but it's really, really going to be fun. There's uh, Michael Gray checking in. Hey, Michael. Gary Hempel, John Krause checking in. So what I thought I'd talk about today is some of the things I've been able to do here lately. And golly, I've, 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 I've been working with a guy that bought a hunting property north of Belzoni, Mississippi. 
and he lives in Omaha, Nebraska, and one of his dreams about this property, several hundred acres, low fenced, uh, deer mecca, waterfowl mecca, it's in the Delta, you know, and one of the things that uh, just that really struck me, I, I went over there Sunday, came back Monday, but I've been talking to him for probably a month, month and a half, and his right-hand man found these videos and started watching them and thought, well, heck, I'm going to go find that guy. Hi, John Funk, 44 degrees and rain. Well, we're at dress warm, buddy. <laughs> I think we were 65 degrees and clear today. Nice rainstorm yesterday. But anyway, there's Dion Myers. Hey, Dion. And so we are, uh, um, he's got this piece of ground that is, of course, there's not much ground that's really flat, but this is just about as flat as it gets. And uh, Gary Hempel says, howdy, y'all. Well, howdy. And we're, uh, I think from, he's got a 23-acre field that he wants to put about a, an 8 to 10-acre lake on. And it's going to be a levied lake because over there they've got groundwater, fairly shallow, so they can pump it. There's Zach checking in from Pennsylvania, Zach Bollinger. And uh, so he wanted me to figure out the cut and fill. How much dirt is he going to have to move to build an 8 to 10-acre lake? Well, I think he needs some water 10 feet deep. I think he needs some water eight feet deep, minimum depth six feet deep because he can keep it full with a with an irrigation well that's already on the property. And as I started doing some measurements, he's gonna have to spoil a lot of dirt because the the he's, he's gonna set the levee at the 115 foot above sea level mark, but he's, or he's, he's gonna have to go down. He's gonna start at 115 and go down to 108, which means he's gonna have a seven foot high levee at one end and almost be at natural ground level, but he's gonna go up two feet to get out of the floodplain. So what that all means is he's gonna have a lake shaped kind of like a double kidney with some peninsulas in it, and it's gonna take 60 to 80,000 cubic yards of dirt excavated and that lake lined with clay. So when he's going to do that, one of the one of the obstacles is that you you really have to seal that lake. You got to build the levees above natural ground level to get out of the floodplain, which means you're not going to depend on rainfall at all, except what falls straight down out of the clouds. There won't be any runoff. He's got to keep it full of the well, which isn't that big a deal there because of the size of his well. Tom Davis from Ohio, Dick Tabert. I'm going to read what you got here in a minute, Dick, but. In order to build the habitat, what I'm telling him to do is we need at least three places that are semi-bowl shaped where the water goes down to at least 10 up to 12 feet deep and then coming up at six feet with kind of a flat going up to five feet so we can build some habitat on top of the clay liner. Now we're talking about rock piles, we're talking about gravel spawning beds, <clears throat> there's some pretty dense forest there, uh, riparian area, because he's in the middle of a big oxbow lake, basically. So he's got some really, really old dead trees, by the way, that we're going to use as part of the habitat. So we're going to use, there's a rock quarry not far, so we're going to use some big rocks, we're going to use brush piles, we're going to use mossback fish habitat, and his goal is to grow as many big bass as he can in that space. So that's pretty dead gum fun too. There's John Wilson. Hey man, John, good to see you, buddy. The uh, let's see, we got uh, holy cow, things are slipping by me here. Jeremy Duckworth. Hey Jeremy, how you doing, man? Tom Davis, Dick Tabbert. Fish feeding at the pond way way down. Water temperature 65. Turn the morning from six seconds to three seconds. Cut the afternoon feeding out altogether. The evening feeding from six to three. Okay, let's talk about that. <clears throat> what ha what's happening, Dick says, is water temperature is beginning to drop from the 80s. It's down into the 60s. So his fish are not quite as active at 65 as they were, say, at 75. So the choice he's made is he's, he was feeding three times a day to really get... And Dick Tabert grows some giant bluegills. If you haven't seen his bluegills, go to his Facebook page or Big Bluegill Pages on uh, Bruce Candelo's Big Bluegill page. Go look at some of those pictures of his fish. He's got some beasts. And I presume he's feeding Aquamax um, sport fish, probably MVP or 500, maybe 600. So uh, cutting the feed back, the way you decide to do that is watch the fish. Be out there, if you have a feeder, be out there when the feeder goes off. And when the feeder goes off, you'll be able to tell what the fish are gonna do. 
because when they start getting sluggish, they won't eat as much. And that's pretty. That's a pretty good way to go with it. So, uh, Nanny Matt, don't need no tough meat. My last dentist left me with alligator teeth. I spent a lot of time picking teeth. Forgive me. Well, let's bring some floss, dude, because we're going to have meat. Zach says, looks like in this month we might see some little white fluffy stuff. Well, if that happens in Texas, it's cotton. Mark Dyer knows the drill. Hashtag Pond Boss Magazine. Matt Mitchell, got my pond almost done. Thanks for your help. Hey, Matt, glad to help. There's Tim Jackson with Purina. Tim works over there in the Carolinas. Man, he is, he is steady, rock solid, taking care of those dealers over there. And he's a big proponent of the Aquamax feeds as well. And we deeply appreciate our partnership with, with Purina Mills and Texas Hunter Feeders, by the way. Those two help sponsor this, uh, this show. Tim says, hello, Mr. Bob Pond Strong. I love that. That's good stuff. Um, I, believe it or not, I have a personal trainer that comes out. My wife makes me do it. And he's fun. And he uh, he comes he came up with the phrase, let's do it. You know, like the way I take it is quit whining, but it's kind of like just do it, let's do it. So I do the best again. There's Christopher Aguilar. Hey, man, we got somebody from Tibido on here. I'm wondering if y'all are kin. Scroll back down and you'll see. You guys got to know each other. Hell, you speak the same language. <clears throat> so anyway, going back to Mississippi, with the, the, the thing I tell everybody is establish your goals first. Because if we don't have goals, we can't do anything. You know, his goals are, I want to have healthy fish with a legitimate chance of growing some double-digit bass, some huge bluegill for kids to catch, because he's bought a hunting property. Waterfowl and deer. That's his two, that's his two big deals. And this property is pretty famous. And anyway, he wants to, you know, between hunts in the afternoons, people he wants people to go out, walk out on the dock, or go around the perimeter of the lake, key point, and be able to go fishing and catch some fish. So I drew up a little habitat map and I drew up a little picture of the lake. And every bit of the habitat I have put on that design is within casting distance of the shore. And with a 10-acre lake, he's going to have as much shoreline designed in as a 20-acre lake would have, a typical 20-acre lake, because I'm going to have it meandering, have a peninsula that comes out. One of his things is we don't want any cotton out of the water moccasins. We have a, um, oh, what's the, what's the, long, the, the brush hogs that, that lean up and then lean down? He wants to be able to go down to the end of a peninsula, turn around, and have those... Um, wing something, bat wing, got it, bat wing mowers to be able to mow without going out over the water and having to back up. So the end of these levers are going to look like cul-de-sacs. Michaela Poe, hey Bob, it was great hearing you speak at the Purina Lifestyle Conference a couple weeks ago. That was fun. I'm so glad you joined up with us. That's a, that's a really, really fun event. Christopher says he's late finishing his gumbo. Finishing making it or eating it, dude? I know. You probably made it and then you inhaled it. There's Leo, Leo Nam Wynn checking in from the left coast. And uh, what Michaela's talking about is uh, I was invited to go speak at a conference in St. Louis for Purina Mills and at the farm to talk about the opportunities that Purina dealers have to provide more products and better services to their customers. So I was kind of coming at it from the angle of pond management, you know, growing bigger fish, showed them some pictures of big fish. That was what we were doing. That was really fun. Frank James, my forage pond is really full of young of the year coppernose bluegill. I've been feeding them small pellets like Aquamax 400, but wonder when I should switch to regular pellets or would a mix of small and regular be best? MVP, Frank James. Go buy, go buy a bag of MVP, nine pellet sizes. What I love about MVP, guys, is that with those nine pellet sizes, about 20% of them are designed to slowly sink through the water column. The reason that's important is that allows those little bitty newly hatched bluegill an opportunity to get in there and compete. Because most aggressive fish are gonna eat the feed as soon as it hits the water. That means they're gonna be exploding on the surface all over where the feed hits the water. But what, what happens is as those little bitty pellets just fall down through the water column, those smaller bluegill get a better chance to feed, and if they can eat just a little bit, just two or three nuggets at each meal, they'll grow phenomenally faster than they would if they didn't, weren't getting any. So, switch over to MVP. Christopher Aguilar making it, takes a few hours, yeah, what's, hey, top this up, so everybody knows, 
What's the Holy Trinity in all Cajun foods? You know this. Everybody that lives in South Louisiana, tell everybody what the Holy, Holy Trinity is, Christopher Aguilar. Top that up in there. And of course, everybody knows the secrets in the root, right? So anyway, going back <coughs> to this fellow in Mississippi, he, um, he wants to be able to fish it from shore, mow it with a bat wing mower to keep the <laughs> water moccasins at bay because this place is surrounded by an oxbow lake, water moccasins everywhere, and he doesn't want them coming up and hanging out on his fishing lake, especially when people are out there enjoying it. So he wants to have a lawn, a, a kind of an infinity look all the way around it. Pretty fun. Let's see, Zach Bollinger, in your personal opinion, do you prefer ponds with well water or stream creek fed but not a big fan of damming natural streams? <clears throat> well, I'm a, I'm a really bigger fan of using what nature gives us. So what I would rather do, my personal opinion is I'm okay with damming up a stream or a creek, especially if it's in a wash. So what I love to do is take eroded places and figure out how we can take that eroded place that's sending silt and dirt and erosion downstream and wind up in the rivers, which winds up in the Gulf of Mexico or the ocean somewhere, and stop that erosion by building a pond because that property is not functional anyway. Now, if this is a live creek with a riparian area with some big old growth trees, no way. I'm not going to mess with that. That's really, really good. Onions, bell peppers, and celery. The holy trinity of Cajun food. a boy. There we go. Love that. That's it. That's exactly right. Onions, bell peppers, and celery. That's the holy trinity of Cajun food. All right. Let's see here. Um, so anyway, I'm, <clears throat> when you say natural stream, if, if it's a running, flowing stream, I don't particularly want to dam it up. I don't mind damming up a tributary of that stream. But if it's a stream or a creek that is dry most of the time and is heavily eroded, I love to dam those up because we take land that is causing a problem by eroding and stopping the problem and giving it a new life. Because when you give it that new life, when you put water there, things start to grow around the perimeter, wildlife drink in it, feed around it, and you create a brand new living ecosystem it's otherwise a desert to anything living, pretty much. <clears throat> so that's my answer on that. Let's see. Matt Hines says, how many bass of bluegill should I harvest from my existing three and a half acre pond per year? And how often in that year should I take some out? Does it matter when and how much I harvest? Yeah, great question. That's exactly, that's a real good question. So Matt, in a three and a half acre pond, if it was stocked properly in the beginning, it's going to take about three years before your pond begins to reach maturity. Now, by the end of that third year, some of your bass will have spawned the year before. Most all of them have, will, will have spawned that year. So after the third year, harvesting some bass is a good thing. Now, if it's a moderately productive pond at three and a half acres, then the standard recommendation is to harvest about 20 to 25 pounds of bass per acre per year, spread it out over the season. Now, here's the caveat. You don't want to harvest the best of the best fish. I had a guy one time that I told him, you need to harvest 25 to 30 pounds of bass per acre per year after the third year. Well, he heard those first two statements, but he didn't listen to that last one. In the second year, he called me and says, man, I've really been harvesting fish, and now, good gosh, it's not working very good because I'm not catching as many fish. Well, heck, he was harvesting his originally stocked fish. You want to preserve those, Except by the third year, <clears throat> the best of the best of those originally stocked fish are excelling. They're the, they're the bass that are getting bigger faster. There's going to be those, and those are females. Then there's going to be some that are above average, some that are average, and some that are below. So by the end of the third year, start, it's okay to start harvesting bass 13 inches and smaller. Think about that, 13 inches and smaller. By the third year, if you're first year bass is 13 inches, you're not performing. But if they're 13 inches and they're young of the year, it's okay to harvest those because they'll replace themselves. So there's your answer for that. Let me see here. I want to go back here. Does it matter when and how much I harvest at one time? 
You know, <clears throat> here's the way I look at that. <clears throat> if you weigh and measure some fish as you go, the fish will actually start telling you because their growth rates will level off. When, when you start catching 13-inch bass the, or one pound and two ounces instead of one pound four ounces like they were, then you see their growth rates leveling off and beginning to decline as a trend, that's a sign that you need to be catching those fish. Personally, I like to catch them throughout the course of the year, but uh, we do have a few clients in our pond management side of the business that want us to help harvest them with the electrofishing boat. So the electrofishing boat is random. So we can go out in one day, we can harvest maybe 15 to 20 pounds of bass in one day and select which ones based on their body condition and sometimes based on their sex. So when you're catching them and harvesting them as you're catching them, one thing you gotta be careful about is that you don't over harvest the most aggressive fish. So I'd still be selective about the fish that I take out. If you catch one that's chunky, even though it might be a little bit underweight, thick across the shoulders, and it hit that lure hard, and you thought, well, this fish is a fighter, throw it back. But if you catch some that are lean, their tummies are drawn, their tails are thin, you know, the back, their back looks like a V instead of a U, take some of those out. Okay, Brad Rom, howdy. Hi, Brad, good to see you. Gary Hempel, I, I live, I live damned old creeks. I live, okay. Maybe I love damned old creeks. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, chicken and sausage. Well, we got a little Cajun food going on. Zach says, hardly any streams are dry. We get about four feet of annual rain, rain, rainfall annual. Yeah, I can see that going on in Pennsylvania. You know, but still, if you think about it, every stream that's, that's, that has water going all the time either has a spring or is continually fed by other tributaries. Those other tributaries that are eroded, it's okay to build ponds there. In my opinion. You ask for my opinion, that's it. Mark Dyer, a pond in central Nebraska, wanting to diversify the pond with new fish to catch. It's got large amount of bass, bluegill, three acres, eight feet at the deepest, rock on a fourth of the bank, clarity around one to two feet, temperature average 83 degrees. Is that too warm to add perch? What about rock bass? That is not too warm to add perch. There's Mitchell Morton checking in from uh, North Carolina. Mitchell Morton, man, he's famous for two things. First of all, he works for Foster Lake and Pond Management Company. And secondly, he's a damn good uh, jazz musician and blues musician in his own right. I haven't had a chance to listen to him, but I do follow him. I kind of lurk on his Facebook page a little bit, and I love Mitchell Morton. And he's always just been rock, rock solid, steady as a biologist over there in that part of the country in the Carolinas. Okay, so Mark, uh, think about smallmouth bass. Now, I wouldn't stock any smallmouth bass smaller than what your largest or your medium-sized largemouth bass can eat. When you tell me you've got rocks, I kind of lean towards some smallmouth bass because your climate in Nebraska is going to be more, um, it's going to be better uh, conducive for smallmouth bass. And even only even when you only have eight feet of water, I think you can do real well with smallmouth bass. Yellow perch would be a good idea as well. Rock bass are okay, except rock bass have a big mouth. Rock bass are a species of sunfish, and they don't get real big. You know, if they get big as your hand, that's pretty big. So I, if you want to diversify with a fish, rock bass adds diversity, but it doesn't really add a fish that can sustain itself. It's going to compete with your other fish. I'd rather see you put in smallmouth bass and yellow perch. So let's see what Tim Stewart's saying here. He says, is there some way, oh, let me scroll down here. Is there some way I could get fingerling largemouth bass that are featuring, that are feed, I get probably means feed trained and raise them in a cage and then release them into the pond myself or possibly keep them in a small pound the pond that I also have and then release them into a larger lake or pond later. There's Bob Wisher, Purina Mills. Good to see you, Robert. Um, the thing about putting fingerling largemouth bass in a cage, when you put them in a confined space, they don't have the opportunity to be totally safe from water quality changes. Now, I know you have a place in Florida, so I'm gonna assume you're talking about Florida. The thing about Florida is, if you're gonna put them in a cage, you need to put them in a cage big enough that they don't eat each other, which they will do that. You might start off with 100 bass and end up with six before you even know it, even though they're feed trained. So you're gonna to wanna to call them 
And the biggest fish, if you're going to do it in a cage, you need two cages. So you put the biggest, fastest growing fish in their own cage as they, as they explode and grow. And then uh, the confinement, they need to have enough vertical room to be able to escape hot water and a lid on top so all those birds in Florida don't get a free meal. You know, the, um, let's see here. If I were going to be doing it, Tim, I think the other pond is a better idea. Just be sure that there are no other fish in that pond that will eat your fingerling bass. And that way, if you put them in a, in a, in a small pond and you grow them up, they're going to have plenty of space. They're going to have some habitat. You'll be able to feed them so they get what they need to eat. So what you'll see is about 30% of those fish grow up really, really fast. And of those, about half of those are going to grow way, way fast. So you can selectively harvest and put those in your other pond when you get ready. That's the way I would approach that. So let's see here. Christopher Aguilar has been high pressure and low pressure one after the other. That's really confusing to these fish. But the fish don't think. They respond. High pressure, low pressure, high pressure, low pressure. When there's a low pressure system coming in, they sense that with their lateral lines. The lateral lines full of gas that goes to their brain and triggers instinctive behavior. So with a low pressure system coming in, that's a trigger to the bass that they're free to move and they better eat because things are getting ready to change. So as that front's coming in, they go on a feeding frenzy. Those fish are going to feed heavily and then after the front passes and the pressure begins to rise again, they're going to stop feeding for a few days until things level off. When it levels off, then they're going to get back into their regular habits. Bob Wisher says, what is a good time to stop feeding Aquamax? Well, I start slowing Aquamax down when the fish start slowing down. I don't stop feeding it. As a matter of fact, I've got some lakes under management like in the Carolinas and Central Texas where we're going to feed the bluegill all year long. We just cut it way, way back. Uh, feed train largemouth bass start slowing down in the mid-50s. Channel cat do as well. Uh, bluegill are going to feed down into the 40s. Now, you just may not see them. They're going to blow up on it like they do right now. So stop feeding the fish Aquamax when the fish stop eating the Aquamax. That's the best answer. Derek Wolf checking in from North Texas. Good to see you. Danny Mack says, my mother's last husband. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I love the way Danny. I can't, Danny, I can't wait to hang out with you next week, man. My mother's last husband would buy land with year-round water, damn it, make beautiful lakes, and hunt. Okay, hunts in the hill country up around Kerrville, Texas, which is, um, what was it? it? used to be those pearl beer commercials from the land of a thousand springs or something. <clears throat> and around the Highland Lakes, which is along the Colorado River in the hill country. Us youngins with our wives would camp on the dams. After the war, he started a resort at Lago Vista, which is, that's on one of the Highland Lakes over there. Highland Lakes are um, Buchanan, uh, Inks, um, Canyon, no, not Canyon, LBJ, uh, Town Lake. I can't remember all the names of the lakes down there. Marble Falls. So um, before that, he twice built resort hotels at Port Mansfield. Probably the reason he did it the second time is because a hurricane blew him down. Oh, yeah, that's what he says. But after two hurricanes, he wouldn't even fish salt water. First, got to take a seismic crew in Louisiana. Found nothing but lignite. Well, we're going to have some stories to tell next week, fellas. Kerry Beckman, the spreading chicken manure in your pond help to seal it from leaking? No, it doesn't. It actually makes things worse. Because what happens with chicken manure is it, it tends to dissolve into the water. You know what the white stuff is in chicken manure? I hear everybody saying it. Chicken manure. The white stuff's going to dissolve into the water and cause, um, ear cause, cause problems. So if you're going to stop a leaky pond, Kerry, it's smarter to figure out how it's leaking and why it's leaking, and then choose a better product that's inert. The chicken manure is going to fertilize the water, and it's not going to plug anything up. It didn't plug up a chicken's butt. It ain't going to plug up your pond. There's the quote of the day right there. Y'all write that down. But bentonite, you know, sodium bentonite could be a cool, good tool. Aqua block could be a good tool. Um, ESS-13, there's all kinds of soil amendments out there. That, that could be uh, a good choice to stop a leaky pond, but I would not use chicken manure. 
Okay, let's see. Tim Stewart said the only other fish in the tiny pond are tiny bluegills that are stunted. Okay, I would, I would, uh, yeah, I'd be t now just as long as you're absolutely 100% sure that that's true, then I'd put them in that pond because when you put those bass in a cage and you feed them, they get conditioned to that cage. And when you put them in a pond, they get conditioned to that pond. They get conditioned to the habitat. They get they get conditioned to the natural food chain, to the bugs and things. If you got them in a cage. You know they're not gonna they're not going to expand their horizons so to speak. There's Ron Arduan, the third Cajun checking in. Ron, we got uh, somebody from Tibido. You know uh, you know the Boudin man here as well. See Mark Dyer biology question: Some smallies have red eyes. Rock bass do as well. Do the red eyes have any significance or give them any predatory advantage or just a color variation that doesn't mean much? That's it, man. It's just a color variation. It doesn't mean anything means nothing at all other than that's a cool genetic trait. We love fish with red eyes. Uh, it doesn't, they can't see any better. It doesn't make them uh, less of a target from a predator species. So it really doesn't have anything to do with it. Let's see, Mark says, instead of rock bass with the pert smallmouth, would red ear be a good option? Um, I'm gonna tell you, red ear could be a reasonable option. Now, the thing about red ears, is they don't really like cold, cold water. Now here's what that means. So if you're in Nebraska, you're gonna have cold, cold water, but you might not. If your pond freezes, um, and you've got a good thick layer of ice, then you've got a cap on top of your water that's gonna preserve the warmer temperatures down below. Where we are from here, from North Texas up toward Oklahoma City where ponds don't freeze, we can have water temperatures that get down into the 33, 32 and a half degree range. That can be fatal to red ear sunfish. So I'm gonna tell you, if you get a good thick ice layer and you've got some depth where the water temperature won't drop below about 40, then pretty good chance red ears are gonna make it. Now here's the issue, is do you have an adequate food source and an adequate amount of habitat for them to thrive in when it's not cold? If you have that, then they can do pretty well. Let's see, Nick Tabbert's back on board. Looks like he had to take a break, so here he's back again. Let me make sure I'm not missing anything here, guys. I think I pretty well got you guys. I think I'm caught up. <coughs> okay, let's go to another story here. Let me think about it a minute. I, I think I'm gonna circle back to the um, Mississippi trip. So he's gonna have to build his pond above natural ground level levees all the way around it, but he's going to have to remove so much dirt that the levee configuration is going to be such to be conducive that the scrapers can come out and dump dirt and store dirt. So his, this, this whole 23 acre field is going to probably be three feet taller than the surrounding fields to have a 10 acre lake on it. So the inside slope of his levee is going to be three to one going down to the depth, whatever the depth is, down to about five feet, then then a little bit less steep slope going all the way down to 10 or 12 feet deep. No depth less than five feet in the bottom. But on the back side, he may have a, an eight or even 10 to one slope that he can mow with the bat wing mower. You know, and, and I looked at that ground the other day and it was cracked, dry, and it hadn't had much rain except that day when I got there, we were driving around in the rain and covered in Bermuda grass. So he's gonna be able to take that topsoil, move it out of the way, define the perimeter of the lake, build a core trench, build a levee, line the bottom of the pond, then build the peninsulas. Then we're gonna go in and add all the different features like six flags over black bass over there. So Danny Max says today on an FB pond site, let's see, a wreck that you can control, wreck, okay, today on a, on a uh, okay that you can control shoreline algae with hardwood ash. I don't know that. <clears throat> so somewhere you read on a on a Facebook pond site that a recommendation you can control shoreline algae with hardwood ash. I don't know that. Because you burn a lot of hardwood working on barbecue, okay? Give it a try, see if it works. I've tried that, I haven't seen any success with it. But that was 35 years ago and I gave up on it. Red here is with everyone else on the forum. I put in 20 with 100 bluegills and ain't never seen one. Here's the deal about red ear. Here's the deal about red ear. Uh, 
Red or sunfish, if you catch a big one, take your pinky and stick it down his throat. When you get it in the back of his throat, you're going to feel there's something pinching down on the end of your finger. There's two bony pads in the back of the throat of every red ear that are crushers. So when they swallow, they can swallow a snail or a mussel and they can crush it to be able to swallow it so they can digest the meat. That's why they call them shell crackers over in Louisiana. Or they, what else? They call them shell crackers in the southeast. Uh, call them chinka pen perch over there where Christopher Aguilar is. Yeah, how about them tigers? You know what? You guys are ranked up now like when uh, after Georgia got beat and you guys had a really good game. You vaulted up there, boy. I bet you guys are ready to play my Aggies. There's uh, Elmo Liner, Jim Liner checking in from Montgomery, Alabama. Good to see you, Jim. So red ears, if you don't have what they need to eat, which is snails and mussels, they're not going to do well. Well, snails live on vegetation. So if you've got bushy pond weed, you've got American pond weed, or some of the other rooted plants, you're going to have snails. If you've got snails, you'll have red ear. If you have enough snails, you have big red ear. So that's kind of the story the, uh, about red ears. So Dick Tapper says, when I stopped my red ears, it was three years before he saw one. That makes sense. Matt Hines, what forage fish and bait fish should I be stocking to help an existing three and a half acre pond to become a trophy bass pond? <clears throat> you should be doing two things. You should be uh, zeroing in on bluegills. Bluegills are the backbone of the food chain, except the farther north we go. You know, Nebraska, they'll spawn two and three times in a year if they're well fed. So if you're feeding those fish and you get three spawns, bluegill are the backbone. I'd also look at pumpkin seeds in, in, in ponds north. You know, if you're north of the Mason-Dixon line, pumpkin seeds are probably as good a choice as bluegills. The problem with bluegills, the farther north you go, the fewer times they spawn, they spawn later in the year. And they grow That one spawn grows fast and has a tendency to outgrow the predator species that are trying to chase them down. <clears throat> so, and uh, the farther north you go, red deer don't seem to do as well because they don't have enough growing season to really thrive. So in the northern ponds, I'd be looking at things like yellow perch. Even though they're a predator fish, they're still a pretty substantial forage fish, especially in lakes and ponds that are crowded with predators a little bit. Pumpkin seeds are good as well. Golden shiners could be a decent choice. Uh, Christopher says, I caught one of my red ears last month, a year old. There you go. Hey, Justin Shank, checking in. Well, it's only 5 o'clock on the left coast. East Central Indiana, that's right. In Indiana, Matt, you're going to have um, one to two bluegill spawns in East Central Indiana. Maybe a third one in a good year. So I'd still be leaning on bluegills, but I'd also hedge my bets with pumpkin seeds. I'd even be thinking about golden shiners and yellow perch in East Central Indiana. <clears throat> so that's where I'm going with that. My throat's getting crusty, boys and girls. Um, see, what else can I tell you about that lake in Mississippi I'm helping design? Pretty well hit the nuts and bolts of that. We're going to have to create a stocking plan because one of the things I tell folks is establish your goals, then think about a timeline of when you want to be able to catch good fish, and then let's talk about a budget. You know, I had a, had a guy call me that was from South Louisiana, moved to Houston, uh, worked, broke out on his own, built a company. The company that he left bought him out. He's made a ton of money, bought this nice farm, overpaid for it, overpaid to have a lake renovated, and then he started complaining about the price of fish. So I just said, dude, you know what? Shame on you. You, you, you've spent this money on this property. You, you're bragging about it. Actually, nobody tells me how much they spent on this property, but you did. You know, you're, you're going to build a, an 8,000 square foot lake house. That's a weekend place. You spent six figures renovating an eight acre lake. And now you want to go get fish out of the neighbor's ponds to put in it. You don't want to spend this money on these fish. Not good guys. If you can afford to do it, if you can afford to build the pond, you need to budget enough money to stock it properly if your goal is to have a fishing lake. You know, so his goals were, 
I want to have a fishing lake in two years. And here's what that means. I want to be able to catch two to four pound bass. I want to be able to have forage fish that, that can uh, live beyond that. And I want to be able to catch 25 bass in an hour. Okay, well, those are reasonable goals, but you're going to write a check. You know, and when and when you go stock it out of the neighbor's ponds because your ranch manager knows the bulldozer's cousin who's been catching fish out of the neighbor's pond helping him cull, if the neighbor doesn't want them, why do you want them? You know, you're going to buy somebody else's cull. So I, I don't want to get off on a really far rant, but here's, here's the deal. Think about how you're going to do it. You've done everything right up to this point. Now, do this right as well. So I, I, I rewrote a proposal, sent it back to him, and that was five days ago, and I've had crickets. So we'll see how it works. Tim Stewart, will pumpkin seeds readily take fish food? No, they will not. <clears throat> Neither do red ear sunfish, unless you're Bruce Candello and you've got time to spend conditioning those fish over and over and over in an enclosed recirculating system. Then they will. You know, so uh, pumpkin seeds are... The, the fish that like fish food are bluegills, uh, yellow perch can be trained pretty easily, um, channel catfish can be trained easily, tilapia, where you can have tilapia, they're feed trained easily. The ones that are almost impossible are red ear sunfish and crappie and largemouth bass. You can even train smallmouth bass some if you're consistent, like Pavlov's dog, same place, same time. Now, you're not going to train them to eat fish food on fish food. You're going to have to start them on something that's natural to them and then convert them to fish food. Job one is to attract them to you. And you, need, you might need to do that with minnows. You might be able to do that with a little bit of sunfish. But, you know, uh, at the fish farms, they do it with krill. They'll, or they'll take, um, oh gosh, what are the little shrimp that you buy the seeds from Great Salt Lake, and you put it in, then they're alive. You can brine shrimp. You can feed them brine shrimp, and they'll they'll start coming to you. Once they start coming to you, you're basically chumming them in, conditioning them to come up to where you are. And once you get them coming up, then you can begin <coughs> to mix things and convert them to fish food. But it takes a long, long time. Mark Dyer, pumpkin seeds would be awesome. Finding a hatchery in Nebraska with them much more challenging. I tell you what, Mark, go to uh, go to the Pond Boss website, pondboss.com, click on Ask the Boss, and post up there. You don't need to register. It's free, and nobody's going to bug you. Excuse me. Good gosh. Then uh, post a question. Where can I buy pumpkin seeds in Nebraska? And TJ Hudson will chime in, and he'll tell you. Let's see here. Christopher, career versus... Off time versus paycheck versus upkeep versus dreams equals pawns. You know what? That is dad gum right. Career versus off time versus the paycheck versus the upkeep versus the dreams. Well, I think I put the dreams at the top of that equation and then uh, it might even make more sense. But you're exactly right. The thing is, is we always make time to do what we want. I, I had a um, had a debate with my son, oldest son, Ty. Good gosh, this was a long time ago. This was probably 1993 or 94 when he was a teenager. And he said, um, we were having a debate about how much the government should help people. And there was this kid that was, at, he, Ty played football at Pacific University in Stockton, California back in the early 90s. And he said that uh, his deal was that, that their quarterback was a guy named Troy Cop, And Troy was homeless for a while because both of his parents lost their jobs. So Ty in this little debate, Ty and I were going down the road having a debate. He picked one side, I picked the other. Well, to make a long story short, he thought the government should pick up the tab for these two parents that lost their jobs and couldn't find a job well enough that they could keep their home, keep their family together, eat and all that. So what I told him was, how many hours in a day? You know, how many hours in a week? Let's see, 24 times seven, what is that, 168 hours? And we sleep eight hours a day, that's 56. 164 minus 56. What do we do with the rest of that time? You know, so I know that all of us, we take time to do what we want. And then 
we uh you know we we got to mix in some fun because all work and no play you know makes makes the Cajuns not really fun they're dull <laughs> so Bruce Candelo hey Bruce we were just talking about you a while ago conditioning fish to fish food just a little short diatribe Tim Stewart says could you re-answer the question about pumpkin seeds taking food had to jump off for a second pumpkin seeds won't eat fish food now if you do like Bruce that's what brought this topic up Bruce if you do like Bruce Candelo does where you've got the time and you got a recirculating system and if you want to try to make pumpkin seeds get on food, Bruce does it with red ears. He's tried it with crappie. I don't think he had a lot of success with the crappie. <clears throat> but he did get red ears to eat. Now he's got some red ears that look like bowling balls. I mean, they're huge. You know, so uh, pumpkin seeds do not naturally eat fish food. It's just not in them. Let's see here. There was a question above that that just flew by. Justin out there in California A says, how do channel cat do during cold winters? Do channel cats do well in trout lakes? Um, let me answer it like this. Lubricate my throat. Channel cat are warm water fish. They don't like cold water. They're nocturnal. They're, they're predators. They're not scavengers. And so in cold water, they're sluggish and they have a tendency to congregate in schools and hunker down. Now, when they get hungry, if their metabolism rate is such that they need to eat, then they'll go eat. But when it's cold, they're not going to do so well. Now, some of these trout lakes, especially in California, the water at the surface is warm enough that the channel catfish will rise up there. <clears throat> because what happens in some of those lakes is you'll have uh, the three layers, like you do in every lake. You'll have you know the top layer, the middle layer, and the lower layer. The lower layer is pretty much devoid of oxygen. The thermocline in the middle in some of these trout lakes, that thermocline where the water is genuinely sterile um, or clean, that thermocline might be 10 feet thick. In that case, the water temperature is cold enough to support trout with enough oxygen that they don't die. Well, the channel cat will live above that and then they can thrive there. But in a true trout lake, channel cat won't do that well because they've only got 60 or 70 days every summer where they can actually grow at a reasonable rate. So they don't, they don't do so well in that environment. There's Mike Rosa and Jeffrey Soto. We got some superstars checking in. James Sampson, howdy there. Christopher says, uh, can an owner of an existing pond add new fish with a real chance of the new fish not being decimated? You bet. Stock them bigger than can be eaten. <clears throat> what I tell people that want catfish ponds, for example, they start off with a catfish pond, get the catfish up to two, two and a half pounds, and they start calling to eat some fish. Well, in most catfish ponds, they're put and take fisheries. Put them in, grow them up, catch some, eat them, stock more later. Well, as those catfish get bigger, you've got to stock bigger catfish. Or if you've got largemouth bass, it might be smarter to stock 10 to 12 inch catfish every time you restock. So yes, you can. And... Uh, like a typical example of that question is where we, we, we come, I, I'm talking to a guy right now that is trying to find the very best ranch to buy because he wants to create a, a, a hunting and fishing paradise for disabled veterans. That's his mission. <clears throat> so his, he, his goals to me are, I want to be able to take people that have served our country and have been wounded mentally, physically, uh, however, and I want them to get out in the woods, have fun, catch some fish. So as we were talking about that, he's looking at one place that's got a lake on it that's at least 50 years old. He said, can we, can we take that lake after you analyze it? And if, if we analyze it and there's fish in there that are not as good as they should be, can we leave them alone and add new fish to rebuild it. And I said, you know what? We could probably do that, especially if we use feed train fish. Now, if we're not going to use feed train fish, then we need to cull some fish in a lake like that after we analyze it to confirm this. We'll cull some fish, we'll replace them with some better genetics, beef up the food chain, and then four or five years down the road, you'll have much, much better fishing. 
<clears throat> so the question is, uh, yes, you can. Our catfish spawn at the house. I'll put in 200 catfish, feed them up to about two pounds, put another 100 in there, feed them up. By now we're starting to catch the bigger catfish, wait another year or two based on how many we harvest, put a few more catfish in. That way we've always got multiple sizes of catfish coming up. Now I did one year put in some uh, uh, large mouth bass because I wanted to grow some out. And because of those bass, I had to keep stocking bigger bigger fish, so bigger catfish, so the bass wouldn't eat them. So, let's see here. I'm kind of losing track here. Because my computer just cratered out <clears throat> a little bit. Okay, now I'm back up. I'm seeing it here. So, anybody got any more questions at 720? Here, because if not, I may wrap us up. Sitting here trying to think, what are the things have I been doing lately? Well, we've been getting ready for the Bob Lusk Institute of Higher Pondology. If you want some information on that, and send me an email at info at pondmoss.com. I'll send you the brochure. We've got room for one more person. Tim, I hope that's you. Let's come. Come on, man. Uh, if you want to talk about it, call me. You've got my cell number. All right, so Christopher says, and where do you release the new fish? Deep, shallow? Well, it depends on how big they are. If they're... Um, if you're going to put six to eight inch catfish in a pond that's got bass, then you probably turn them all loose at the same place near vegetation and water two feet deep. Because it's going to take them about 45 minutes to get oriented. And if there's some vegetation, the water's two feet deep. Beyond the vegetation, the water gets deeper. They're going to at least get a chance to get reoriented because they got, they got collected they got confined, they got transported in this water, introduced it to your water, <clears throat> they're a little bit shocked. Like, where in the heck am I? So, in that case, stock them in two feet of water to where they can get to deeper water when they're ready, and, you're out, and if you stock them all in the same place, the few that do get eaten are gonna get eaten locally. If you spread them out, you're gonna feed more fish if you do that. Robbie Shell, executive with Purina Mills, Hey, Bob, great live event. Hey, man, I appreciate it. We appreciate Purina and their sponsorship of this show. We've been talking about feeding fish pretty much the whole show, Rob, so that's a good thing. So anyway, that's kind of the drill on that, guys. Um, the Institute of Higher Pondology is coming up. If you want information, send me an email. I'll tell you about it. We're looking forward to it. So my throat's beginning to give up, so I think I'm going to tune this out and call it a day. Go pick up my granddaughter and from dance lessons and take her home. So guys, listen, as always, I deeply appreciate you watching. Appreciate the sponsorship of Purina Mills, Texas Hunter, even Mossback Fish Attractors as well. So you guys, uh, thanks for joining me tonight and tune back in next Wednesday. It'll be the eve of the first big Institute of Pondology. I'm really excited about that. <clears throat> Holy cow, we got more people coming. Let's do this. Micah Jefferson, Southern Indiana. Good gosh. John Thompson. James Sampson, hybrid gills versus blue gills. I'll hit that next time. So tune in next time and ask me that question. I'll cover it next Wednesday. So in the meantime, thanks for tuning in. I will see you next Wednesday night live from right here, Palm Oscar World Headquarters. Adios.